All right, today we're talking about Howitz rigidus, um, also known as big toe arthritis. Um, this comes in various forms, various causes, but it's really common. Um, usually what we're talking about is this big toe um, decides that the cartilage is gonna be worn out and it starts to get really, really irritated. When this advances, you're gonna see big bone spurs coming off the top of the big toe joint. Early on, it may look fine on x-ray. It may look like there's no issue, but if you, got an, if you get a MRI or just during a surgery, you look in there, oftentimes you'll find holes in the cartilage, uh, pockets of cartilage missing. Usually the most common reason for um, big toe arthritis to form um, is good old osteoarthritis. It's wear and tear arthritis. It happens because the alignment of the big toe and the first metatarsal is really poor. So sometimes if you look at an x-ray from the side, you'll see that the, big, the first metatarsal is elevated quite high. Sometimes that happens with flat-footed people because of the position of the foot. Sometimes they just have a loose first metatarsal cuneiform joint and that first metatarsal elevates. Well, what happens when it's elevated is the big toe can't get around it. It gets stuck right there. And when I'm in surgery, Right, that part of the cartilage right there often is worn down to nothing, down to bone. And as that big toe continues to hit right there and grind upwards, the irritation it causes on the other bone causes this first metatarsal head to get really big. You get a big, large bone spur there. You'll often get smaller bone spurs off of the base of the big toe, and they're often broken. When I do surgery on these, I'll have to clean those out, find, and I'll find a lot of damage in there. You'll find a lot of synovitis, which is a uh, um, inflamed scar tissue hanging around inside that joint. Um, anyway, so when the first metatarsal is left elevated and the big toe jams repeatedly throughout the day, and we're talking small little jamming motions, we're not talking about a big painful event. Every time that happens, it adds up to a little bit of inflammation, a little bit of damage. Multiply that by five, ten thousand steps a day, several years, 10, 20 years, that joint's going to wear out. And on x ray, we'll go through some x rays. What you'll see <clears throat> is the joint surface is narrowing, the cartilage will wear away. You'll see big bone spurs on top. You'll see what's called ebernation on the top of, or on both sides of the joint where the joint, where the bones themselves have become very dense and calcified. It means they're under a ton of stress. Um, the more bone it dumps on there, the harder it becomes and it becomes really hard. Um, it becomes very difficult for the, the joint to move. The harder it is to move, the more it jams, the more pain you have. People talk about it hurts first thing in the morning. As they get walking, it starts to loosen up. If it's not too bad, it'll feel okay during the day, unless they've been walking a ton, then it gets to be really painful. If it's really bad, it might warm up a little bit during the day, but it hurts more and more and more you're on it. <clears throat> so on x-ray, there are ways to classify how bad it is. And depending on how bad it is, that, that determines um, what surgical options you have. Other causes of first metatarsal phalangeal joint um, arthritis are gout. If you have a lot of gout attacks, we'll talk about that in a different discussion. A lot of gout attacks can eventually wear out a joint, but that's usually for more advanced gout. Um, it doesn't happen after a few attacks, but the more attacks you have, the more likely it is to happen, so it's good to control that. Rheumatoid arthritis is famous for destroying the joints of the toes, although it's more rare than osteoarthritis. Infection can do it, um, and fractures fractures will definitely do it. People come in all the time and say, I broke my toe five, 10 years ago. The toe's kind of hurt ever since. And what, what happened is the fracture line went through the joint. There were uneven surfaces that over time rubbed and rubbed and destroyed the cartilage. And, and that can get ugly pretty quick too. So uh, we'll go through a few different x-rays and, and show the different levels of arthritis, but that's, that's it in a nutshell. So what are your options? If it's early on and all, all that is happening is the joint's intact but it's jamming and hurting, sometimes we can get great success with a very stiff shoe. The stiffer the shoe, the better off you're going to be. Uh, this is uh, just an example of a shoe that I can barely bend. Uh, this is by Apex. You can get a lot of great shoes out there. Um, New Balance, the higher the shoe number, the better in general. Uh, the Brooks Beast is a good one. Um, doesn't have to be a name brand shoe. If you bend the shoe and you literally can't bend it, that's the one. 
The less motion at the big toe, the better you're gonna feel. However, as with all arthritis, if you don't use it, you lose it. And if you really do wear extremely stiff shoes and have a great orthotic in there, um, it may stiffen up more on you and it kind of hastens the problem. If you're missing a ton of joint or a cartilage in a joint, it doesn't really matter. Eventually you're talking surgery, but this could slow it down. As far as orthotics, an orthotic is just an insert in your shoe. And if we can create a pocket in the padding or in the shell of the orthotic to allow this first metatarsal to sit lower, um, it allows for that big toe to rotate much easier. And that oftentimes will help people who are in the early stages of arthritis. So it's worth trying. Usually you gotta do a custom orthotic. Um, that's where they take a mold of your foot and create it to your foot. This is not an off the shelf thing. Um, you know, don't go to the good feet stores or wherever for that. You gotta get a good custom made orthotic from a podiatrist or an, or an orthotist. Um, so if you can position that big toe low enough, um, sometimes that takes the stress off the big toe and you're good to go. If those fail, uh, you can always try steroid injections. I usually use a combination of dexamethasone and triamcinolone or Kenalog. The steroids, um, to be truthful, um, knock out inflammation very well. But if your joint is, in, is uh, damaged, if there's bone-on-bone -bone contact, it's only gonna act like a Band-Aid, give it enough time and it'll be back. So you can get a few months of relief from a steroid shot I've got a few patients that come in once a year and they seem to do quite well for six months, eight months or more. Um, but it's only delaying the inevitable. <clears throat> and the real problem is if I pump really strong steroids into a joint repeatedly, that cartilage is going to thin down. Um, you're going to actually hasten the damage of the joint and we're going to be talking about surgery even sooner. So occasional steroid shots getting you through a bad patch are fine, but if you do too many, um, it's also a bad thing. So. You, you quickly move through the conservative options into surgery if that doesn't uh, alleviate your pain. Surgically, um, it kind of depends on how aggressive you want to be. It depends on how much pain you're in, how bad the joint is, and how much risk you want to take. So starting from the least uh, destructive procedures and moving to the most destructive, the least destructive is, a, is called a shortening osteotomy. It's very similar to a bunion osteotomy where we cut through the end of the metatarsal, take off a few millimeters of bone and try to shorten it. The shorter it goes, the more you'll see that joint open up and it allows the joint and the big toe to move freely or at least more freely. If the toe is, or I'm sorry, the first metatarsal is elevated, when we move the end of that bone, we try to move it back and down. And the further down we can get it to go, the easier that big toe will rotate. So sometimes that helps. Um, I've seen those surgeries last 20, 30 years from my predecessors. It's a good option. Um, if the joint's already locked up and it's really bad, it may not work. It may not be your best choice. If you're missing a lot of cartilage, it's not a great choice. Uh, but for the early stages of arthritis, you might as well give it a try. You're not burning, burning any bridges. You can move on to the other surgeries if you want to in the future. Uh, the second level of surgeries that I like to do are, are implants. We used to do Cartiva implants. That's a big no from now on. Um, Cartiva was a synthetic cartilage implant that would just fill up the space between the bones. On the operating table, it was amazing. It was nice and smooth and squishy. It felt like brand new cartilage. Turns out they don't last very long. Um, every surgeon I've talked to around here in Utah um, has stopped using them for the most part. And the studies that they published just don't hold up in real life. I would say greater than 50% of people have, have to have those replaced or have the joints fused or, or have other implants put in uh, when those fail. So I'm decidedly against Cartiva anymore. I, I had high hopes for it, but it's just not working. The one implant that I am using now is called Arthrosurface. Um, only a weird podiatrist office has big toe models, but here you go. Um, Arthrosurface is a company that made some really uh, creative implants. Um, most of the time you don't need this portion on the base of the big toe, but you can if it's the joint's in really bad shape. Um, I, more often than not, I'm using this portion of it. Um, you can see that we're replacing the end of the metatarsal head. The engineer here is really cool. They've covered the entire head of the metatarsal with metal all the way up to the top so that big toe can freely rotate up to where you normally would be able to rotate through. A lot of the older models, or not models, but the older competitors, 
they, they look a lot like this side of the implant where it's kind of flat, you don't get much rotation, the joint tends to lock up. The challenge with these implants is that you have to shorten the bone as you do it. Excuse me. Um, if you don't, the implant's gonna lock up, it's gonna be stiff. And the other thing is, is the patient, if you're the patient having this done, you have got to move this thing as much and as fast as you possibly can from day one. It's very similar to knee uh, replacements where they're, they have you up and walking within hours of surgery. Uh, you have to train the, car, the scar tissue um, and the blood clots and all that early stages of healing uh, to, to allow things to move. If you don't, it'll lock up and you'll, you would have been better off just fusing the joint. So that's the one challenge. It can be done. Uh, we've kind of figured out some of the nuances of this implant and I've had some pretty good success lately. Uh, so that's a good option. This option is for when we're, we've lost a lot of cartilage but we still wanna have range of motion. So my plumbers, electricians, roofers, anyone who needs that kind of position, uh, women who are dead set on high heels, although I don't recommend them, um, if you need that kind of position in your big toe and it's critical you have it, then uh, an implant like this is kind of your last option uh, before we move on to fusing it. Fusing the joint um, is still the gold standard for getting rid of your big toe arthritis pain. The joint hurts because you have bone rubbing on bone, um, cartilage is missing. Every time those two bones touch, they hurt, the nerve endings are exposed, you get big inflammatory reactions. And so if you can get rid of the motion, if you can get rid of that bone-on-bone -bone contact, the pain's gone. It's an excellent solution, it lasts forever, um, and it's still the gold standard to date. However, these implants are getting better and better, and it may be that one day those are the gold standard. But if you have advanced arthritis and the big toe is just shot and there's nothing left in there, oftentimes people come in and they can't even move their big toe. There's so much, there's, the bone spurs are so big, the cartilage is so damaged that it's just stuck. In which case, fusing the big toe isn't a big change in their life because they're already functioning with it uh, without very much motion there. So that's something to take into consideration. Um, you can still run with this, you can still walk, you can still be very active, but you can't move it, so the only motion you do get is at the at the inner phalanger joint of the hallux and further upstream in the in the ankle. The big downside of fusing a joint like that, that is supposed to have a lot of motion, is that that motion is going to go somewhere else, and oftentimes it moves to this joint, which if the toe isn't placed in a good position, oftentimes it will wear out that joint faster than than normal life activities would have, and you'll have to fuse that down the road or sometimes the next joint up here becomes arthritic. Sometimes you don't have a choice. There's no joint left, you can't put an implant in there, you might as well fuse it, and if you're not super active, um, that's gonna last forever and be a great option. I've fused a lot of joints in my time, and most people are quite happy with it. They come back with other foot problems that are unrelated, and, and they're quite ha happy they had it done. For the two, the two first surgeries, the implant or the shortening osteotomy, um, you can be in a post-op shoe uh, that lasts for um, six to eight weeks until the bone's healed. If it's the implant surgery, as soon as that skin is healed in two weeks, you can walk immediately and wear normal shoes. Truth is, it's gonna be pretty swollen and sore, so you may not be able to get in a regular shoe right off the bat but you don't have to protect it very much and we encourage people to walk as much as they can early on to keep that thing moving. If we fuse the big toe, um, the big deal with recovery, you know, the way we fuse it is we put screws across that joint and if it's bad, we put a plate across the top with little screws through it to hold it um, in place until it heals. Once it's healed, <clears throat> you don't need the metal in there but it's often too big of a hassle to take it out or, or it's inconvenient. So we just leave it in there. But during that healing process, if there's any motion here at all, those two bones will fail to fuse together. And now you've got broken hardware. We gotta go back into surgery and fix it. So the key after a fusion surgery is to wear a cam boot, uh, which is extremely stiff. I cannot bend this thing, there's no way. So that, that, that big toe is gonna sit there nice and protected. Some surgeons won't let you even walk on this thing for six to eight weeks. I think that's overkill. I've never had a non-union, to my knowledge, as long as somebody wears the boot faithfully 24 seven um, for the six to eight weeks or more until it's fused. So that's a nice thing about the fusion is you can walk it on immediately as long as you're wearing a boot.
there are treatment options out there that are kind of outside the realm of uh, normal practice standards. Um, there are a few doctors out there putting mini rails. It's a external fixator on the big toe and stretching it out uh, while they do inj injections of synvisc or other synthetic um, uh, um, synovial fluid type products. The data is still coming in whether that's actually working or not. Uh, I don't think it buys you much time, so I'm not a big fan of that. It's an interesting approach, but I haven't seen a lot of success. Um, there's always new implants coming out. Uh, people are trying to compete for that market space. So maybe one day we'll have better implants, but some things that I would not do. Any, anyone that tells you they're gonna put a silicone implant in there, run away. They fall apart, they're junk. Eventually they, they're just a horrific problem to fix and they're hard for people to, to fix later on if we have to fuse it. Those have really run out of steam. They're not very popular anymore, but there's always that one guy out there putting them in and I just, I'm not a fan. I, I've seen nothing but problems with it. it. seems like whenever I go to a conference, they're talking about, well, somebody put this celastic or silicone implant in there and it fell apart, now what do I do? You know, and it's this big challenge, a big hole there. So not a big fan of that. The fusion surgery, one thing to consider is your, your high heel days are done. Anything with a lift is gonna put you in a position where you can't bend the toe, where you want to bend the toe, but you can't. So after a fusion surgery, a lift of an inch or more is about as much as you're gonna get without causing some discomfort at the big toe. Um, but like I said, people are very active. They can be very functional with that, and it seems to be a good option. Um, please remember that the reason for these, these little discussions is to help raise awareness for Operation Underground Railroad. Um, these guys run around the world trying to save kids from sex trafficking rings. Um, Tim Ballard's the man. He's done a lot of awesome work. So go to OurRescue.com and make a donation. Uh, remember these doctor's visits are usually expensive and, and they're valuable information. So turn that into a donation for them and that would, that's our goal. Also, please remember to subscribe. Uh, the more views and subscriptions we get, the more money we can raise to donate to them as well. Um, anything we raise through this channel is completely donated to Operation Underground Railroad. Uh, and it's our pleasure to help fight child sex trafficking around the world. Have a great one.